fantastic. Um, McDonald, McDonald was a preacher in um, the Church of Scotland, or the Presbyterian Church, for a while. Um, he was eventually put out of the church by his parish. That is, they fired him. Okay? They fired him because they asserted that he held heretical beliefs. The heretical belief, in particular, that he held is what is called universalism. And universalism, essentially, is that everybody will be saved. Everybody will end up in heaven with God. Okay? And for McDonald, that everybody included everybody, including Satan. Okay? Uh, it'll take a long time, he believed, but eventually Satan too will be saved. In his other adult romance, okay, this is this is one of the two books that is often called, you know, um, McDonald's adult romances or adult fairy tales. The other one is titled Lilith. Okay, Lilith is a character from Jewish mythology. She's Adam's first wife. Eve was the second wife, according to Jewish mythology. Okay, and. At the end of Lilith, McDonald puts forth this idea that after eons and eons and eons and eons of time, ultimately even <clears throat> Satan um, will be store, restored to unity with God. It's not because God's wishy-washy. It's not because God's a pushover um, in McDonald's belief. It's because ultimately... Nothing can withstand God's love. Nothing. Okay? That eventually even Satan softens to God's love. Okay? Now, McDonald titles this work, Fantasties, A Fairy Romance. Okay? The spelling of Fantasties is an old spelling for fantasy, P-H-A-N-T-A-S-Y. The T-E-S kind of changes the form of speech or the function of the word and changes it from fantasies or, um, or fantasy to individual fantasies, like individual um ideations or individual ideas or individual images okay? and that's largely what this book is it is a series of images of perceptions that the character Anodos experiences as he travels through the land of fairy okay? the name Anodos has two possible meanings. It's from Greek. It can mean either no way, that is, it would be uh, ah or on hodos, okay, this is no, this means way, or the other possibility is that it's um, essentially the same two pieces, but this one means the way up. So it either means no way, as in no direction, no future, okay, or it means the way up, the way forward, the right direction, the right path, okay? 
and the name becomes symbolic the more you get into the story. So, you got an introduction by C.S. Lewis. I don't know if any of you have ever read anything um, by C.S. Lewis. Chronicles of Narnia, for example, we're going to be reading the first volume of the Chronicles of Narnia. The real first volume, Lion, Witch, and the Wardrobe, not The Magician's Nephew. Okay? Um, but I hope you read the little introduction. Because Lewis makes a comment in there on, on the second to the last page, just about the last full page, <coughs> where he says, uh, It must be more than 30 years ago that I bought almost unwillingly, for I'd looked at the volume on that bookstore and rejected on a dozen occasions the Everyman edition of Fantasties. And I was trying to remember when Lewis wrote... The introduction. And I'm pretty sure it was in the late 40s. Okay. Um, so when he says it must have been more than 30 years ago, sometime in the teens. Okay. And notice Lewis says, a few hours later, I knew that I'd crossed a great frontier. That is, he started the book, he'd looked at it several times on a used book stall, okay, and never bought it, okay, he just looked at it, but he finally does buy it, and he says, I knew a few hours later that it crossed a great frontier. I'd already been waist deep in romanticism, romanticism, the movement in English literature that was a reaction against what is called um, the Augustan Age or the Neo-Augustan Age, which emphasized rules and form and structure and romanticism kind of aimed to let's go out and let's learn from nature. Let's enjoy nature. Let's, let's take meaning from nature. And when he says I'd already been waist deep in romanticism, he hadn't been waist deep. He'd been up to his neck. Okay, Lewis essentially tells us in his autobiography. Okay? And likely enough at any moment to flounder into its darker and more evil forms. Because romanticism can really go off the deep end into pessimism and despair. Right? That's what he's talking about there. So, Fantasties was romantic enough in all conscience, but there was a difference. He doesn't mean romantic eros, Love. He means romantic, an emphasis on beauty in nature, an emphasis on taking meaning from nature, an emphasis on getting into the deeper reality of things, seeing more than just what you see on the surface. Kind of what Tolkien's getting at in his discussion about recovery, seeing as we were meant to see. Okay? So, Lewis says, Nothing was at that time further from my thoughts than Christianity. And I therefore had no notion what this difference really was. This was when he was an atheist. Okay? And C.S. Lewis, when he was an atheist, I don't know if you know anything about you know, modern, current atheism. There are a couple of major proponents today. One died a few years ago, and then there's another one um, who's a professor in Oxford or Cambridge. One, Richard Dawkins who's a professor of science, bio, biology or something like that. The other one, the one who died recently, about four or five years ago, is Christopher Hitchens. What's so great about God? It's just about his most famous book, where he just rips religion. Not just Christianity, all religion. doesn't matter. It's all a crutch. Okay? Lewis would have put those two to shame. He was such an avowed atheist. He became an atheist when his mother died, and he prayed to God to heal her, and he didn't. It was like, oh yeah, well, F you. <laughs> okay? But it's not just that he was an atheist. He was a cold, clear, calculating rationalist. I mean, if it couldn't be proven by reason, Lewis didn't want to have anything to do with it. If you remember from the fairy story essay, that little poem that Tolkien includes, Mythopoeia. And I mentioned, Tolkien wrote that poem 
to Lewis. Okay? This was before Lewis had become a Christian. So, nothing was at that time further from my thoughts than Christianity. He didn't want anything to do with Christianity. He hated Christianity. So, he says, I was only aware that if this new world, <clears throat> that is the world he's introduced to in here, was strange, it was also homely and humble. That if this was a dream, it was a dream in which one at least felt strangely vigilant. Always on your toes, in other words. That the whole book had about it a sort of cool morning innocence. And also, quite unmistakably, a certain quality of death. Good death. Now, for a 21st century reader, we kind of have a problem with the very notion of good death. We kind of all think death is just bad. It can't be good. Well, it can. Okay? And Lewis hints at it here, but we'll see in some of the books as we read from here on out, the idea of a good death is, is not odd. It's the more modern, contemporary attitude that death is automatically and always bad that is odd. Okay, in terms of the history of either English literature or the history of ideas even. So, Lewis goes on. What it actually did to me was to convert, even to baptize, and this is where death came in, my imagination. So how do you baptize an imagination? What happens in a baptism? It's a cleansing. You're reborn. In a baptism, I don't care which version you do, whether it's sprinkling or dunking, but in a baptism, okay, what happens? You die and are reborn with Christ. St. Paul's language is the old man, the old Adam dies and you're born again. You put on Christ, as it were, okay? But Lewis isn't a Christian when he has this experience. So how can your baptism of your imagination occur? What is dying? It's his old ideas about death in the imagination. Those are dying, and new ideas are being born. New ideas created by this, not new ideas about Christianity. He doesn't read this book and suddenly go, oh, if only I believe in Jesus, everything will work out. Farthest thing from his mind. Okay? He never actually believes that trite, simplistic idea. So, notice what he says. It did nothing to my intellect or to my conscience. That is, he doesn't suddenly become a more moral person. Nor does he suddenly start arguing for the truth of Christianity. Their turn came far later, and with the help of many other books and men. But when the process was complete, I found that I was still with MacDonald. That is, when he was finally, fully baptized, that is, accepts Christianity, he finds that McDonald was with him still. Okay? And that the process began with the reading of this. It only concluded with the help of many other books and many other people. Long story short, Lewis found when he went off to Oxford to study, and then later on when he went off to Oxford to teach, that hard boiled atheist as he was. All the people he really liked and got along well with were Christians. All the literature, other than classical Greek and Latin, all the literature that he really liked, really enjoyed, was written by Christians. And it really bothered him. He didn't like being surrounded by all these Christians because he didn't like Christianity. But he had to start admitting to himself, well, if I do actually, like, being in the company of these people, there must be something there. Okay? And it was through the company of those people, etc., that he ultimately does become a Christian. We'll talk about that when we do uh, 
language in the wardrobe. Okay. So he says, last bit I'm going to read from the introduction. The quality which had enchanted me in his imaginative works turned out to be the quality of the real universe. What was that quality? The divine, magical, terrifying, and ecstatic reality in which we all live. Not about you. When I get up in the morning and I get ready to come to work, I'm not experiencing the divine, the magical, the ecstatic quality of the reality in which we all live. My reality is pretty much more mundane than that. I'm worrying about traffic. I'm worrying about if my car is going to start. I'm worrying about whether anybody's going to show up to class, you know. It's, it's pretty much low level. So what does he mean that divine, magical, terrifying, ecstatic reality? Well, it all depends on these things. It all depends on how you see it, on how you experience it. And again, it goes back to Tolkien's notion of recovery. I should have been shocked in my teens if anyone had told me that what I learned to love in Fantasties was goodness. Goodness. The quality of being good. Whether we're talking about an individual we're trees. People think trees, what do you mean? How can trees be good? Well, what do trees do? Okay, they create oxygen. That's a good. How else can trees be good? Do they do good? Well, if it's 110 degrees outside in the summer, they give you shade. In other words, he's talking about metaphysical goodness or ontological goodness. Excuse me, ontological. Onto ontology is the, the philosophy of being, existence. It's the very fact that they exist is good. Existence in and of itself is good. This podium okay, is good. This pen is good. Notwithstanding what many people I know would say, this plastic bottle is good. Okay, a lot of people say, no, it's not. It's plastic. It's horrible for the environment. It's gonna. You know. It has being. The very fact that it exists is good. Okay? We'll get into that more later. So Fantasties, a fairy romance. Look at the, the title page here, if yours has it. Fantasties, from their fount all shapes deriving, that is from their fount, all from their source, all shapes deriving, in new habiliments can quickly dight. New habiliments, that's like clothing, can quickly dight, that's write or inscribe or engrave. So, from Fantasties, from their origin, all shapes deriving. All shapes okay, derive from these Fantasties, from these images. Why? Because until someone comes up with the image up here, you never get this. It took Steve Jobs to come up with the idea of that before it was actually created, okay? So, every chapter, almost every chapter, begins with these epigraphs. Some of them long, some of them short. MacDonald was a lover of the Germanic, the German romantic writer, Novalis, okay? So there's a lot of Novalis at the beginning of this. Okay, or at the beginning of, beginnings of chapters. And notice what this one says. Won't read it in the journal. One can imagine stories without rational cohesion and yet filled with associations like dreams, 
and poems that are merely lovely sounding, full of beautiful words, but also without rational sense and connections, with, at the most, individual verses which are intelligible, like fragments of the most varied things. Modern example of what he's talking about, Lewis Carroll's The Jabberwocky. It is a complete nonsense poem. Right? That is, it doesn't mean anything. It's the sounds and the images in it that give value. Here's another one, if I can remember this little short poem. Something I may not have this exactly right. Oh, I just drew a blank on the author. So much depends on the red a red wheelbarrow. Glistening in the rain or rainwater beside white chickens. One, uh, not Juan Carlos Williams. Somebody Williams. Can't remember the first name. That's it. That's the entire poem. So much depends on a red wheelbarrow glistening in the rain beside white chickens. Lines three and four there might be missing a word or be just one or two words off. But that's it, okay? What depends on the red wheelbarrow? Like the world, your life, who knows? But what has that poem done in your mind? Okay, made you wonder what else? It made an image. Because what do you see? A red wheelbarrow with rainwater Beside white chickens. It's like a snapshot. Okay? What did Novala say here? One can imagine stories without rational cohesion and yet filled with associations, like dreams, and poems that are merely lovely sounding, like that, full of beautiful words, but also without rational sense and connections. This true posy can at most have a general allegorical meaning and an indirect effect, as music does, right? How does music work on you? Not lyrics, just music, instrumental music. Thus is nature so purely poetic, like the room of a magician can have the same effect. Why did so many hundreds of thousands or millions of people go out Sunday night to try to see the blood red moon eclipse? Because it wasn't going to happen again until 2033? Maybe. I think it's more because of this. Okay? It doesn't happen often. Why do people take snapshots when you get a glorious sunset? And post them all over on Facebook. Okay? Because it's beautiful. And there's something about that. Okay? That you know, speaks to them individually. And then he goes on. The fairy story is like a vision without rational connections. Okay? What does that mean? A vision without rational connections. Think of a film and how a film works. But you have to think of the film before we see it in the theater. Because the film has a lot more material. And what do they do? That material gets spliced together so that you go from scene to scene. So that it makes logical, um, has a logical sequence. But what happens when you don't have those splices together that go from scene to scene. 
if you ever watch the Harry Potter films, okay, the first couple of Harry Potter films, at least, I think, the first one is, is more like the greatest hits from Harry Potter and the Philosopher's Stone. The greatest scenes. We're going to do this scene, and this scene, and this scene, but what don't the scenes have between them? They don't have the logical links that explain how they go together. That's why if you read the novel and then see the film, I think a fair reading of the film is it's not as good because it omits a lot of the narrative detail to make sense out of the overall structure. Okay? A fairy story is like a vision without rational connections. A harmonious whole of miraculous things and events. Okay? It's like taking a whole bunch of snapshots and turning them into what? A collage. Okay? You take those snapshots, put them all into a collage, do they necessarily all fit together? No. As, for example, a musical fantasia. In a genuine fairy story, everything must be miraculous, mysterious, and interrelated. Everything must be alive, each in its own way. Does interrelated mean have natural, logical progression in links? No. It does mean, however, that there is something that ties the individual images to each other. The whole of nature must be wondrously blended with the whole world of the spirit. In fairy story, the time of anarchy, lawlessness, freedom, the natural state of nature makes itself felt in the world. The world of the fairy story is that world which is opposed throughout to the world of rational truth. This is the world of rational truth. The world of the fairy story, notice what Navala says, is opposed to that. It's not where rational truth holds sway. And precisely for that reason, it is so thoroughly an analog to it, as chaos is an analog to the finished creation. What does he mean, an analog? Well, you all know what an analogy is. You argue to something by means of something else. Okay? You can't have creation, which implies what? order, structure, without what comes before creation. Chaos. Disorder. Okay? So, the novel opens. It's Anadosis yesterday had been Anadosis' 21st birthday. Why is that significant? We even still have this in America in 2015. What happens on your 21st birthday? You're an adult. Okay. In his specific case, what else happens? He comes into his inheritance. Exactly. I mean, in the United States, you turn 21 and you become an adult, which means what? You can legally drink. Big freaking deal, right? Why? Because you can vote at 18, you can join the military, you can go off and be shot at when you're 18, 19, 20. But you can't drink. How idiotic is that? Okay. Can't buy cigarettes when you're 18, 19. Okay. Can you now? Okay. You can't hear, but then Alabama, you have to be 19. Okay. So, he turns 21, and on the night of his 21st birthday, what happens to him? He's given the keys to this old secretary of his father's. This is an old, handmade, nice desk. And the secretary, it's probably, you know, like this big. And on the top part, it's got all kinds of doors and pigeonholes, etc. And he finds one part that has a lock, and he has the key to it. And he locks, unlocks it, and he opens it up, and he finds inside it. He opens up and he finds, and finds inside that the drawers don't go back all the way. 
to the back of the secretary. And he figures there's got to be something else back there. And he pulls those drawers out, and he looks back in there. Old, withered rose petals. And as he's sitting there and looking at this, he sees a little woman. And she says, Anodos, you never saw such a little creature before. I have no idea what page this is on yours. Three? It's seven in this, so our pagination is going to be all different. Um, you never saw such a little creature before, did you? And he says, no, and indeed, I hardly believe I do now. He's talking to her, and he hardly believes that he sees her. That's always the way with you men. You believe nothing the first time. And it is foolish enough to let mere repetition convince you of what you consider in itself unbelievable. She says, it's just like you meant not to believe the first time you see. And it's foolish to simply believe because you see again and again and again. That is, if it's incredible the first time, what suddenly makes it credible the second time? If it's impossible to believe the first time, why do you believe it the second time? Is there something that rationally proves it? Nope. And she says, I'm going to grant you a wish. How can you grant me a wish? You're tiny. She's like the size of this bottle. He's my size or taller. How can you, something so small, grant me a wish? She's like, really? Is that all the philosophy you gained in one in twenty years? Form is much, but size is nothing. It is a mere matter of relation. Okay? Form is much, that is the shape things take, but the size of those things is irrelevant. So she says, okay, I'll accommodate your foolish prejudice, and she becomes full-sized. And now what happens? Now, she says, the next page, you will believe me. Overcome with the presence of a beauty which I could now perceive and drawn towards her by an attraction irresistible is incomprehensible. Notice, he tries to hug her. Why? Because now she's not like a Barbie doll. Now, she appears what? Real. This size... He has a hard time believing her. Why? Because we generally don't see people this size. But when she's standing right in front of them and gorgeous, yeah, we tend to see that. And being a 21-year-old male, he wants to hug her. And she says, if you could but touch me, I should hurt you. Besides, she's what? Yeah, she's 237 years old and... Ew. <laughs> he has desires for his grandmother. That's odd. Okay. You're not my grandmother. And how do you know that? I dare say you know something of your great grandfather's. Good deal farther back than that. But you know very little about your great grandmother's on either side. What is she saying? The women in your family haven't counted for much. In your mind. I don't mean they haven't done anything. I mean, in your perspective, you haven't paid any attention to them. Why not? Okay, because he's a patriarchal kind of person. And I usually do not bring in feminist crap at all, in my opinion. Okay? Because they're not important. After all, it's upon his father's death he gets his inheritance. His mother died long before. Okay? Kind of this grandmother figure looms large in much of MacDonald's writings. And he wrote an awful lot. I mean, you can do a little Google search. He wrote a ton, in fact. And he wrote a lot of fairy tales, specific fairy tales. Right? And the grandmother kind of figure, the wise old woman, um, is in those a lot. 
Okay. So, your sister was reading you a fairy tale last night. Mm -hmm. And when she finished, she asked you, is there a fairy country, brother? And you said, well, I suppose if you could find your way into it. He says, ah, but I meant something quite different from what you seem to think. What did he mean? Or what were his intentions behind saying those words to his little sister? Okay. What was he trying to do to her or for her? He's encouraging the belief, but does he really believe it? No. It's like telling a six-year-old, yes, Santa Claus is real. It's like a 36-year-old telling a six-year-old, yes, Santa Claus is real. Most 36-year-olds don't believe Santa Claus is real. We hope. <laughs> <Okay>. <laughs> she says, Never mind what I seem to think. You shall find the way into fairyland tomorrow. Now look into my eyes. He does, and what happens? This is the first indication of this major theme that runs all throughout the novel. They filled me with an unknown longing, an unknown desire. What is meant by unknown? It's a desire for what? That's the unknown. He doesn't know what it is. But after looking into her eyes, he, he has an angst. He has a hole inside that needs to be filled, but he doesn't know how to fill it. He doesn't know what to fill it with. He doesn't know what to do to try to find what to fill it with. I remembered somehow that my mother died when I was a baby. I looked deeper and deeper till they spread around me like seas and I sank in their waters. It's like he had forgotten that his mother died when he was a baby. And notice, he's diving, as it were, into the eyes. I forgot all the rest till I found myself at the window and where I stood gazing on a whole heaven of stars, small and sparkling in the moonlight. And he says to himself, surely there is such a sea somewhere. Such a sea. Such what sea? Well, to see that he experienced looking into her eyes, where he found himself sinking in their waters. Is he sinking, grasping for air? No. What's he doing in the sinking? This is the beginning of what Lewis was suggesting in that image of being baptized. This is the falling into death. Okay? But it's not fighting against death. All right? It's also an image of the, the sea image and falling into it of being completely at peace. Okay? Being surrounded by the warm, salty water. It's also an image of being in the womb. Okay, where you're surrounded by warm, salty water, essentially. And what? Perfectly safe. Perfectly at home, where one belongs. In fairyland, Anodos. And he wakes up the next morning. And his room slowly starts to change. He sees the marble basin where he has water stored so that when he gets up in the morning, he can splash his face. And the water basin is just that. It's not a sink with a faucet. But water starts coming out of the basin and flowing across the floor. And the carpet that he himself designed to look like flowers, daisies, and grass, becomes daisies and grass. And he gets up out of bed, and he starts walking, and he realizes this must be fairyland. Okay. First person he runs into, chapter 3, a fairy maiden or a country maiden. 
And he comes up and he kind of walks alongside her and he hears her. She's kind of muttering. Trust the oak, trust the oak, the elm, the great beech. Take care of the birch, for though she's honest, too young to be changeable, shun the ash and the alder, for the ash is an ogre, and the alder will smother you with her web of hair. And then she goes on her own way. He's not quite sure what to make of all that. Okay. He goes on, and he finds a house. And he goes into the house, and the old woman asks him, have you seen my daughter? He says, I think so. Do you have anything I can eat because I'm hungry? And she says, yes. And then she looks at him and says, you have fairy blood in you. How do you know? You could, have not, you could not have got so far into this wood if it were not so. In other words, only someone with fairy blood could enter into this wood. And I'm trying to find out some trace of it in your countenance. I think I see it. He says, what do you see? Well, I don't know. I could be wrong. Okay. Um, she talks about eating the fairy's food because she has fairy blood and such. And the little girl comes in and he asks her about the ash. And so they tell him about the ash tree. And they tell him, stay away from it. And they tell him the ash tree will come awake at night and will kind of prowl the wood. And page mine, page 15, the woman asks him, where are you going? I do not know. Think of his name. No way. He doesn't know where he's going. He doesn't have a destination in mind. He's just going. But what general direction is he headed in? He tells us this repeatedly. Eastward. He doesn't know why, but he's heading eastward. Okay? So he says, I want to see everything that I can. So I'm going to start my journey at sundown. They're like, well, that's not. You are a bold youth, if you have any idea of what you're daring, but a rash one if you know nothing about it. Does he have any idea of what he's daring? No. No. So he's rash. Because she's warned him about the ash tree. But no one comes here but for some reason, either known to himself or to those who have charge of him. In other words, he's been sent into fairyland for some purpose. He doesn't know what it is. Okay? And he sits down and he takes the book that's been used to kind of cover the window. And he reads about Sir Galahad and Sir Percival. Galahad's armor shines like the moon. Percival's armor, however, is all covered in rust because of his entrapment by the demon lady of the alder tree. Okay? And he hears the woman say, look there, his fingers. And he looks and he sees the hand of the ash tree. So they talk about flowers and fairies and such. And he goes off and he, as I said, kind of moves in an eastward direction. And he observes the fairies and he observes the flowers. And we go on to chapter four. Actually, I mean, this is all, he's still at the house as they're talking and such. Chapter 4 is when he leaves. And we have two long paragraphs at the beginning. And towards the middle of the second paragraph, he's trying to make sense of what he sees in terms of the glowworms, the fairies related to the uh, flowers and such. And he says, after wondering about one of the beetles, it's no use trying to account for things in fairyland. And one who travels there soon learns to forget the very idea of doing so. And takes everything as it comes. Like a child. Who being in a chronic condition of wonder is surprised at nothing. So notice 
the idea there. In Fairyland, you can't make sense of what happens. Because what are you trying to do? What is logic and reason attempting to do in Fairyland? Rationalize it. But Fairyland doesn't operate according to rules of logic and reason. Okay? So what must you do instead? Take everything as it comes. Okay? What does that mean? Does it mean you shun things? You run away from experiences? No. You let them wash over you. You merely experience it. As he says, like a child, who being in a chronic condition of wonder is surprised at nothing because everything is wonderful. Everything is imbued with surprise, as it were. Okay? So, he keeps going on, and as he walks, he has the feeling that there are other shapes like his own moving around, just out of sight. Okay? This is going to be important later on. He's constantly imagining, he says, that forms were visible in all directions except to the direction in which he's gazing. In other words, if he's looking at right this direction, just over here, there would be other forms visible. Okay? But once he turns his direction there, he doesn't see anything. But just over here, there are forms visible. So, what might Anodos be suggesting? Once he turns his rational sight and focuses on something, what happens? It vanishes. In other words, the attempt to reason, the attempt to understand it, makes the thing kind of go vague or cloudy. And that they only became invisible or resolved themselves into other woodland shapes the moment my looks are directed towards them. So he thinks he sees something. He turns and he sees a tree. He turns the other direction. And what appeared to be a tree now appears to be a human shape. He tries to look at it again, tries to perceive it, tries to understand it, and it's a tree again. However this may have been, except for this feeling of presence, the woods were utterly bare of any human companionship. All right? He keeps going on, and he sees a shadow of a hand. It's a long paragraph that begins, Soon a vague sense of discomfort possessed me. All right? And it's about halfway into that paragraph. He sees the shadow of the hand. He remembers the ash tree. But he says some uncontrollable longing, again, for some, un for some anticipated prey. The shadow is like it has a longing for this prey. There seemed but one mode left of discovering the substance of the shadow. In other words... He wants to experience everything, so he wants to experience the shadow. I went forward forward boldly, though with an inward shudder which I would not heed, to the spot where the shadow lay, threw himself on the ground, laid his head within the form of the hand, and turned and looked up towards the moon. And what does he see? I lay until fear had frozen my brain. I saw the strangest figure, vague, shadowy, almost transparent, in the central parts and gradually deepening in substance towards the outside until it ended in extremities capable of casting such a shadow as fell from the hand through the awful fingers of which I now saw the moon through the awful fingers so what does he see a face it was horrible the face resembled that of a corpse more than anything else I can think of he says it was like a vampire Okay. Why? Why does the ash have the face of a corpse or like a vampire? It's dead inside, but 
What else? It's hungry. It's hungry. It desires. It hungers for something. The most awfulness of the features, the most awful of the features were the eyes. These were alive, yet not with life. They seemed lighted up with an infinite greed, a gnawing veracity, which devoured the devourer. Okay. Go towards uh, next long paragraph in the middle. All I saw was the hand within three feet of my face. That is, he's lying there still, and it's like the hand's coming closer and closer. But at the same moment, I felt two large soft arms thrown around me from behind. And here's a woman's vo voice say, Do not fear the goblin. Do not fear the goblin. Okay? And this woman rescues him. But is she really a woman? No, it's the spirit of the beech tree. And she has him cut hair from her, which is actually branches, and wraps it around him to protect him. Okay? Chapter 5, he goes off. And notice we have a little epigraph about the myth of Pygmalion. The guy who creates a statue of a woman and then brings her to life. Okay? So, he finds food to eat in the forest. <clears throat> and he goes off and finds a cave. And he lies down in the cave on a mound of moss and falls asleep and wakes up and sees what appears to be, carved in the wall, this image of the myth of Pygmalion. And he starts to think about it. And he pulls his knife off and he starts to scratch away at the moss that he's been laying on. And he realizes it's not just a mound, it's a tomb of alabaster, which is a soft kind of stone. And it's translucent. You can see stuff through it. And he realizes there's a woman in this thing. And so he sings to her. And he brings her out of the tomb. What does she do? She flees from him. She runs away. And he runs after her, chasing her. Because what has she raised in him? It's the same thing his fairy grandmother did. An irresistible longing. Only now, it's not an unknown longing. It's a longing for her. Okay? You could even say, I think it's a sexual longing. Okay? So, chapter 6. He keeps going off. And he runs into a knight. And he realizes it's Sir Percival, the knight he read about in the book of King Arthur and his knights. Keep in mind, he is in fairyland. And so this is where kind of all fairy tales come true. All right? And the knight says, I am ashamed to appear knight and in such a guise, and it behooves me to tell you to take warning from me, lest the same evil in his kind overtake the singer that has befallen the knight. Hast thou ever read the story of Sir Percival and the maiden of the alder tree? He says, you know, just before I entered the forest I was. Then take heed. Warning. For see my armor? I put it off. That is, I took my armor off and became entranced by her, enchanted by her. Okay? And he says, this armor will only shine again after what? What does he have to do? By the blows of nightly encounter. Until the last speck has disappeared from every spot where the battle axe and sword of evildoers or noble foes might fall. He's got to go off and perform nightly quests. He has to defeat evil or fight noble foes. And the hitting of their swords and battle axes against his armor is what will polish it. Okay? So then Anodos thinks, well, I've been warned twice now about the maiden of the altar tree. 
Surely it won't happen to me. Okay, he says, I shall not be ensnared by any beauty, however beautiful. Remember at the beginning of the essay on fairy stories, Tolkien talked about beauty that is an enchantment and a peril. This is what he's talking about. I think Tolkien was talking about literally this novel when he wrote that part. Okay? So what happens? He goes off. He still thinks of his white lady that he freed from the alabaster tomb. Okay? What did he just say? Yeah, I won't be ensnared by any beauty, however beautiful. He already is. Okay, by his lady of the white tomb. Or his white lady of the tomb. He goes on. He sings. And he hears a response. And he thinks, it's her. And the lady says, it is your white lady. But there's something to the voice. Notice. That's not quite right. Why? If I would have confessed it, there was something either in the sound of the voice, although it seemed sweetness itself, or else in this yielding which awaited no gradation of gentle approaches. Notice, something in the voice did not vibrate harmoniously with the best of my inward music. That is, it just doesn't ring correctly. You know, there's, there's a notion regarding truth. How do you know something is true? Because it has the ring of truth to it. That is, truth is like a bell. Okay? And it just sounds true. It's the same thing that we mean when we say something sounds too good to be true. You know, you see some stupid little spam on Facebook or whatever. Click on this link and you can get an iPhone for five dollars. Yeah, right. Okay. Or click on this and you are entered to win a bazillion dollars. Or send this Nigerian prince your bank account number and you'll suddenly be rich. Okay. Doesn't have the ring of truth to it. So he goes off with her. She leads him to her cave, and notice she says, but you have to go in first. And what happens? He gets enchanted by the maiden of the alder tree. Cha that chapter ends, chapter, the end of chapter 6. I lay and wept. The maid of the alder tree had befooled me, nearly slain me, in spite of all the warnings I had received from those who knew my danger. Okay. In other words, in spite of logic, in spite of reason, okay. chapter 7, he's thinking about the maiden of the alder tree. He's trying to rationalize. And he walks along, and we're told, he walks along listlessly. That is, without any cares. But it also means without any direction. I don't mean without any direction as in the meaning of his name. I mean without any kind of focus at all. Like he's not even generally heading eastward anymore. Now he's merely wandering. Before there was some internal purpose. He didn't know what it was. But he kept heading eastward. And he's thinking what distressed me most, more even than my own folly, was the perplexing question, how can beauty and ugliness dwell so near? Because what did he see when he finally looked into her face? And then what did he see when she turned? She was hollow in the back. Okay. So he goes on. He sees another house, a kind-looking, matronly woman. She invites him in. 
He burst into tears. And she says, it is just as I feared, but you are now for the night beyond the reach of any of these dreadful creatures. It is no wonder they could delude a child like you. And then she mentions her husband. And she says, but I must my believe my I must believe my senses, as he cannot believe beyond his. Okay? I must believe my senses. What does she mean by that? Keep in mind she's part fairy. She sees all the fairies. Exactly. She sees and perceives all the fairies. Just as he cannot believe beyond his. What do his senses tell him? There are no fairies. He can't see them. He can't experience them. Is she saying he's a fool? No. She's saying he's limited to what he can experience and sense. Okay? So, he asks, Anodos asks her, how can she be so beautiful without having any heart? She says, I'm not sure, but I'm sure she would not look so beautiful if she did not take means to make herself look more beautiful than she is. That is, she wants you to think she is beautiful. Therefore, she makes you think she is more beautiful than she is. What does she do, the old woman is saying, to men she comes into contact with? She makes herself what? Desirable. Okay? And then, you know, you began by being in love with her before you saw her beauty. Why? Because you mistook her for the Lady of the Marble. Another kind altogether. That is, another kind of beauty altogether. But the chief thing that makes her beautiful is this. Although she loves no man, she loves the love of any man. Okay? Her desire is what? Her desire is the desire of others. She feeds on the love of men. She doesn't feed on love itself because she is incapable of love. And when she finds one in her power, her desire to bewitch him and gain his love... Not for the sake of his love, but that she may be ooh, conscious anew of her own beauty. She is ultimately what? A narcissist. What does she love? Herself. Okay. Through the admiration he manifests makes her very lovely. And so, the more love a man shows for her, what does that do? To her appearance to him. It makes her even more lovely. With a self-destructive beauty. For it is that which is constantly wearing her away. Okay. Her beauty, the old woman says, is wearing her away. Where? From the front? Towards the back? No. It's eating her away from the back to the front. Why? Because it's her narcissism. And her narcissism is focused on what? On her essence? On her being? No, it's on her beauty. So it starts back here. And the last thing that will go will be her face. Till at last the decay will reach her face and her whole front. And then what? All the mask of her love will fall and she'll be vanished forever. Okay? Um, her husband comes in. They, they talk. They talk about fairies and Anodo says, you know, I didn't really see any fairies, but I did see some things I don't really understand. And the husband says, perfectly natural. Right? We all see things that we don't necessarily understand. Why might we not understand them? Well, you know, you can witness the conversation from afar, but you're not part of the conversation. So you don't understand everything that's going on there. Okay? 
And the old man says, Now you would hardly credit it, that is, believe it. But my wife believes every fairy tale that ever was written. I cannot account for it. That is, I don't understand her. She is a most sensible woman in everything else. That is, take fairy tales aside, she is a sensible woman. What does he mean by sensible? Rational. Common sense. She makes good decisions. Okay? So, all other aspects of life, I can understand her perfectly. But when it comes to fairy tales, I don't understand. Look at Anadosa's reply. Should not that make you treat your belief with something of respect, though you cannot share in it yourself? That is, if you say she's completely rational and understandable in every other aspect of life, shouldn't you therefore give a little bit of respect to her attitudes towards fairies? We're going to see almost the same thing in Lewis's um, Lion, Witch, in the Wardrobe. There's going to be a scene where the two older children go to the professor in whose house they live. And they're going to talk to him about their younger sister, Lucy, and brother, Edmund. Because Lucy says she has gotten into the secret country called Narnia. And Edmund says, no, actually, I was just playing along with her. It's not real. And so they talk to the old professor, and he says, okay. On the whole, which of the two would you generally say is the more truthful? And they'd say, well, Lucy, of course. And he says, okay. So if Lucy is generally more truthful, and Edmund is generally the more untruthful, why would you now believe him and not her? And their response is, well, because magical secret countries don't exist. And you know that how? Which kind of makes the two children go. He's crazy. <laughs> okay. But what's he doing? He's applying sound, basic rules of logic. How do you know the magical secret country doesn't exist? What is your proof of its non-existence? Merely that you haven't seen it? I haven't personally seen Pluto, notwithstanding photographs, okay, because as we all know, photographs can be not real, okay. I haven't personally seen an atom, doesn't mean it's not real, okay. So, the father says, yeah, that's all very well in theory. But when you come to live every day in the midst of absurdity, it is far less easy to behave respectfully to it. What does he mean in the midst of absurdity? His wife's belief in fairies? Or his experience of what is unexplainable by his reason? It could be both of those. So the old man asks him, where are you headed? eastward. He asks, does the forest continue much longer? He says, long ways. But take this trail, take this path, and you'll get through it. Okay? He sleeps in a bedroom that is not known to have any problems, and he sleeps soundly. And the next morning, the old lady tells him, um, a white lady's been flitting about the house all night. Okay. And Anado says, When I looked out the window this morning, I felt almost certain that Fairy Lane was all a delusion of my brain. Why? Well, it's partially the room he sleeps in. Okay. But why else? It's the influence of the old man who's influencing him to not believe in fairyland. Because what does Anado say? But whenever I come near, near you or your little daughter, I feel differently. I could almost persuade myself after my last adventures to go back and have nothing more to do with strange beings. And she asks, 
How will you go back? I, I do not know. And the reason she asks this question is because those who enter Fairyland, there is no way of going back. You have to go through. Go through doesn't mean going like this, turning around, and going back this way. You have to traverse it. They must go on and go through it. How, I don't know. And Anadol says that's quite the same impression in my own mind. Something compels me to go on, as if my only path was onward, like the way up. Okay. He doesn't know why. It's just something pushes him forward. Okay. So he goes off again. He comes to a little clearing in the forest, and he sees another little house. Now, what was he warned of by this family? The ogre. Okay? The house of the ogres. He doesn't see any windows, but he does see an open door. And we're told, an irresistible attraction caused me to enter. He goes in, he sees a little old woman, and she's sitting there, her head's down, and she's reading a book. And as soon as he steps across the threshold, so then, as darkness had no beginning, neither will it ever have an end. So then is it eternal. The negation of aught else is its affirmation. Where the light cannot come, there abideth the darkness. The light doth but hollow a mind out of the infinite extension of the darkness. And ever upon the steps of the light treadeth the darkness. Yea, springeth in fountains, blah, 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 blah. What is the old lady saying about darkness? It's never ending. It is ultimately the building blocks of everything. It is the only thing that is eternal. Okay? Truly man is but a passing flame, moving unquietly amid the surrounding rest of night, without which he yet could not be, and whereof he is in part compounded. And when you die, you what? You go back to the darkness. Now, why is what she's reading significant for what is going to happen in just a few moments? Because he goes in the house, the little room, and he looks around, and he sees a door, which he thinks is to a cupboard. And he goes up to it, and just as he puts his hand on the handle, she says, don't open that door. And those words do what to him? Yeah. They make him even more want to open the door. So he opens the door. And he just sees household utensils. Until he focuses at the back. And he realizes what he thought was the back of the wall is actually kind of an infinity. It's a sky. And then he sees coming towards him. A little teeny tiny black figure. And it comes and comes and comes and comes. And as it comes right to him, he moves out of the way and it runs out. And he looks around and he doesn't see it. Where is he? There on the floor behind you. And there lay a black shadow, the size of a man. What is it? It's only your shadow that has found you. Everybody's shadow is ranging up and down looking for him. I believe you call it by a different name in your it's not a shadow, because we're going to see in just a few moments, one day he comes out in the next chapter, one day he comes out on a grassy hill with the sun ahead of him, and his shadow moves in front of him to be between himself and the sun. Okay. He lays down, chapter 9, he lays down, and where he lays down in the grass, and gets back up, the flowers and the grass slowly return to their proper shape. But where the shadow lays down, what happens? The very outline it could be traced in the withered, lifeless grass, in the scorched and shriveled flowers which stood there, dead. One day, having come out on a clear grassy hill which commanded a glorious prospect, 
though of what I cannot not tell, my shadow moved around and came in front of me. So he comes out on the hill, and he sees this beautiful like landscape in front of him. He can't remember exactly, as he's writing this after the fact, okay, what it was. Because what happens? The shadow comes out and moves in front of him. And presently a new manifestation increased my distress. It's like the shadow comes out and blocks his sight. So now what does he see? He sees through the shadow. Or as St. Paul says, now we see as but through a glass darkly. Okay? And presently a new manifestation increased my distress. For it began to coruscate and shoot out on all sides a radiation of dim shadow. These rays of gloom issued from the central, central shadow as from a black sun, lengthening and shortening with continual change. But wherever a ray struck, that is, wherever the shadow sends out this ray or tendril, that part of earth or sea or sky became void and desert. What had been full of life and green before now becomes dead. On this, the first development of its new power, one ray shot out beyond the ray, seeming to lengthen infinitely until it hit the sun, and the sun goes dark. Okay? He goes on. And we're told... Um, he starts to, to get along with his shadow. Paragraph that begins... But the most dreadful thing of all was that I now began to feel something like satisfaction in the presence of a shadow. Why? What does his shadow provide for him? In a land like this, so many, with so many illusions everywhere, I need his aid, look at the language, to disenchant the things around me. What does that mean, to disenchant? Yeah. To remove enchantment. To show it like it is? Or just the opposite? To show it like it really isn't. To remove, he's saying by disenchant, to remove the sense of wonder. Okay? He does away with all appearances and shows me things in their true color and form. And I am not one to be fooled with the vanities of the common crowd. That is, I'm not one to go along with the crowd. I will not see beauty where there is none. Okay. I will dare to behold things as they are. And if I live in a waste instead of a paradise, I will live knowing where I live. What's he saying? If I have to accept that my life is crap, I would much rather live that than live how? Thinking it's better than it is. In another one of C.S. Lewis's Chronicles of Narnia, The Silver Chair, there is a scene where this character Puddleglum and these two kids, Scrub and Poole, Eustace, no, it's not Eustace, can't remember the names, are captured in an underworld, okay? And they've been enchanted by this witch. She's trying to get them to believe that there is no overworld, that is, there is no world on top of the earth, that their experience of what they call Narnia is all an illusion, is all a fantasy, okay? And she's doing this partially by this incense she has burning in this fire. And Puddlegum, who is a strict kind of rationalist, who is a skeptic, who never sees anything good happening, it's always, yeah, the sun's up, yeah, but it's going to get hot later. Clouds are coming. It means it's going to storm. It's humid. It means the midges and the mosquitoes are going to come out. He always sees the black lining to every 
silver cloud, in other words, okay? He stomps his foot on the fire, his bare foot, on the fire to put it out. And he essentially makes this little speech to the witch. Even if my world of Narnia is false, my false world of Narnia, with its goodness, with its talking bears, with its noble animals, with its heroes and knights, is a damn sight better than your real world of darkness and despair. And I will choose to live in the false world of Narnia any day rather than the real world down here. Okay? And in doing so, he dispels the illusion she has created. Notice what's happening here. The shadow is doing what? It's creating an illusion. Okay? This is, and I'll talk about this more Thursday, this is Plato's allegory of the cave. Okay? And we'll stop there.